Good evening and welcome to, t to tonight's webinar. Tonight we will be covering uh, CompTIA's Network Plus exam in 10-005 and the specific objectives this evening are 1.5 and 1.6. Those particular objectives are default ports and networking protocols. So tonight, well, right, let's go ahead and begin with default ports. So first off, let's talk about what default ports are. Default ports are TCP IP uh, ports. And when a client needs to request a remote service, usually it, it hits on a default port. And what that means is it sends a request to the remote service and the port will define what uh, service is provided. In that way, the remote service knows exactly what the client is requesting. And so Network Plus requires that you know some specific default ports. And tonight we will cover those. The first one is going to be SMTP, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. Uh, that is on the, the, the default port 25. By the way, in the second half of this, we will be discussing a lot of these um, protocols. But for this first portion, we'll just be going over what ports they HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol, Web Servers, that is on the port 80. Then there's HTTPS, Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure, that one is default port 443. And we have FTP, File Transfer Protocol. Uh, that one initially uh, used two ports. It used port 20 for data transfer and port 21 for uh, control. And that was the commands. That has since changed. Um, and I'll cover that in the second half of this webinar. But you still need to know that ports 20 and 21 are FTP. Telnet, uh, for those of you who don't know, that is a bi-directional. That means it goes two-way, virtual terminal. And that is default port 23. Then we have IMAP, which is Internet Access Message Protocol. And that uses port 143. Uh, then there's RDP, Remote Desktop Protocol. This one is proprietary, uh, proprietary to Microsoft. It's also known as the Terminal Service Client, and that is for when you're doing a remote desktop, and it uses a default part of 3389, so 3389. Then we have SSH. Secure Shell, it's the replacement for Telnet, and it uses port 22. Then there's DNS, Domain Name System, and that uses port 53. Um, and I just went back a slide, sorry about that. And then we have DHCP, Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. This one uses two default ports. The first default port is 67. That is on the server side. So when the client sends a DHCP request, it's sending that request on port 67. And when the server responds, it's responding to a default port of 68. You're going to need to know that. And then there is POC3, Post Office Protocol version 3. And that one is a default port of 110. These are all uh, 
reports that you're going to need to memorize. I hate to tell you that. Uh, you sh you're going to need to know them and recall what their default ports are for the Network Plus exam. So that takes care of uh, exam objective 1.5. Before I move on, are there any questions? Hearing none, guess what? Now we're going to go on to the networking protocols. This is where we get to define a bunch of these. And the first part's not very exciting. This part gets better. So the first thing that we need to talk about is the TCP IP suite. And what is that? Well, it consists of four layers. It consists of the application layer, the host-to-host -host layer, the internet layer, and the network access layer. Now, if you're familiar with the OSI model, which uses seven layers, uh, the TCP IP suite is a little bit different. Uh, the OSI model layers one and two correspond to the network access layer. Uh, Layer 3, which is the network layer in the OSI model, is the internet layer in the TCP IP suite. Layer 4, which is the transport layer in the OSI mo model, is the host-to-host -host layer in the TCP IP suite. Also, that a lot of the times, that's also called the transport layer in the TCP IP suite. And finally, the... Uh, application, presentation, and session layers, which are 7, 6, and 5 in the OSI model, those are all rolled into the application layer of the TCP IP suite. All the networking protocols that you need to know about are in this suite in one way or another. Uh, you're going to need to know the difference between TCP, which is Transmission Control pro Protocol, and UDP, which is User Datagram Protocol. Uh, both of these are the, at the transport layer of the OSI model or the host-to-host -host layer of the TCP IP suite. Uh, they both kind of perform the same function, but a little bit differently. Uh, TCP is a reliable delivery service, which means that it requires the receiving host or the receiving end of the transmission to send an, an acknowledgement back to the sender. If the sender does not receive the ACK, it resends the information. It also, uh, also performs orderly delivery which means it sequences the packages uh, and it sends them in order, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, so on and so forth, so that when it gets the acknowledgement, it knows exactly which packets have been received. It also offers some error control or error correction. Uh, the receiving end can send back that it did not receive a packet, and so the sending side will resend that packet. Now, UDP is also a transport protocol, uh, but it uses best effort delivery. It just sends the information. It does not wait for an acknowledgement. And it's faster. It has lower overhead but it's more error prone. Uh, voice over IP is one of the big uses of UDP. There are also some other protocols that use UDP instead of TCP. Uh, you tend to use them in, in situations where it's more important to, to keep a smooth flow of information rather than making sure that all the information is sent and received. So now let's talk about FTP. 
uh, it transfers files between clients and servers. And like I said earlier, originally it used two ports. It used TCP and it used TCP on ports 20 and 21. Uh, port 21 is now used for both data and control. Uh, so it no longer uses port 20, but you still need to know that it uses port 20, or it used to use port 20. Uh, FTP is not very secure. Uh, it sends everything in the clear, which means it does not encrypt any data. It also requires that you log in with a username and password. A lot of FTP servers use a user or have enabled a username of anonymous, and a password is usually just blank in that situation. <clears throat> but sometimes they will add a password to it. <clears throat> Excuse me a moment. <clears throat> then there's TFTP which is Trivial File Transfer Protocol. And it also transfers files between clients and servers, just like FTP. But it uses UDP, and it uses port 80, or excuse me, port 69. Now, TFTP does not require a username and password. It's usually wide open. And the most common uses for TFTP are for downloading uh, configuration files or operating systems. One of the big uses, or one of the yeah, you know, one of the big uses where you'll see TFTP used is in configuring routers. A lot of the times, uh, companies use a standard configuration for their routers, and that's contained on a TFTP server. So when the server, or excuse me, when the router is fired up, it contacts the TFTP server and downloads its configuration file, and voila, it's up and running. Uh, it has a low overhead. It's faster than FTP, but it's also very insecure and easily broken. Now let's talk about SSH. That is Secure Shell. It is the replacement for Telnet, which was a virtual terminal. It encrypts the transmission, both coming and going, uh, much more secure, and it uses TC port, TCP port 22. Uh, anymore, if you're logging into a, a remote terminal or using a remote terminal, you should or will use SSH. Uh, DNS, Domain Name System. This is what resolves computer names to IP addresses. This is what, uh, DNS is why you can type uh, www.google.com into your search bar and get to Google, get to the correct address. That's because of DNS. Uh, it uses TCP port 53 for TNT. Excuse me, for DNS zone transfers. You'll learn about those later. Uh, when you're using it from the client side, you're actually using UDP port 53. That's because uh, you can keep on sending it if you don't get the response back. Then we have DHCP, Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. And that is what automatically assigns IP addresses to hosts. Now, when the PC or laptop is fired up, it sends a, re a request on UDP port 67 saying, hey, what IP address can I use? And when the DHCP server responds, it sends back sends it back on port 68. Uh, that is the standard, and that way both sides know that a request is coming and that a request was, or an answer to a request was sent. Then we have ERP. That's Address Resolution Protocol. 
Now this resolves an IP address to a MAC address, a media access control address. When you're dealing with networks, uh, routers understand IP addresses. Switches do not understand IP addresses. They understand MAC addresses. Uh, there has to be a system in place to translate between the two, and that is where ARP comes into play. And ARP does not use a designated port. Then we have HTTP, the one that most people are familiar with. HTTP allows the bidirectional connection to and from a web server. That's how you request a page, and that's how you get a response back. Uh, you, send the, you send the request on port 80 for HTTP, and it comes back on whichever port you told it to respond to. Uh, the receiving end, usually the return end, usually is not port 80. Then you have HTTPS which is the much more secure version of HTTP. It encrypts the transmission, both coming and going, using SSL or TLS. Actually, it started off with SSL, which is secure socket layer. Uh, later, it was changed to uh, transport layer security. And we will talk about TLS here in a little bit. Uh, HTTPS has a default TCP port of 443. And this is how and why you can use your credit card on the internet without too much fear of it being compromised, unless, of course, that system was uh, subject to the Heartbleed attack. And I'm not really going to go into that tonight. So I just mentioned TLS, that's Transport Layer Security. Uh, it is an asymmetrical cryptographic protocol. Now, it's asymmetrical because, uh, I'm trying to think of how best to put this. It's asymmetrical. It uses a public key and a private key to encrypt. Uh, and it uses, uh, excuse me, cert certificates. Uh, it, they're very hard to break and should be very secure. It does provide security for the internet, internet transmissions because it authenticates both ends of the, of the connection. Without that authentication, uh, you don't have the security and it won't allow you to connect. Then we have IC each protocol on uh, boy on port 143. Well, I didn't write that down, and I do believe that's port 143. Um, it does work at oh no, it's excuse me ICMP, not IML. So Internet Control Message Protocol. That one doesn't have a designated port. Sorry about that. Sorry for the confusion. It works at layer three of the OSI model. It is strictly a um, IP protocol. The most famous uh, application that uses ICMP is Ping, and it is a simple connectionless protocol. It really doesn't care if it connects or not. Then we have Telnet. Uh, already talked about Telnet. It uses TCP port 23, and it's a non-secure virtual terminal. If you're still using Telnet on your network, um, I would recommend that you en enable SSH because anybody using something as simple as Wireshark can see your your username and password and hijack your telnet. Uh, 
and that would not be very good. Here we go. Now we have SMTP, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. That uses a default port of 25. SMTP transfers outgoing email from the client to the email server. SMTP also is what transfers email from email server to email server. Uh, most of what you're going to need to know is it's outgoing from client to email server. That's how it leaves the PC. Then we have POC3, Post, o Post Office Protocol V3. And that's how the client receives email from the email server, and that uses a default port of TC, a default TCP port of 110. And it is an application level protocol. It is a top level protocol. You're going to need to know that one, by the way. <clears throat> and when you receive email via POP3, it actually will, in most cases, if you're using the default configuration, it will delete the email from the email server. That led to some issues in some situations, and that's why IMAP was created. And currently, we're talking about IMAP 4. That's Internet Message Access Protocol version 4. And that uses a default TCP port of 140, 143. And it's similar to POP3. That's how a client will can receive email from an email server. But the difference is, it, in its default configuration, it, leave, or, yeah, it leaves a copy of the email on the email server. Uh, that way you can sit at your desk and receive that email, uh, and then use your mobile device to receive that same email, and then go home and log in and receive it at home. Uh, it will leave the email on the server until you specifically tell it to delete it from the server. That is the main difference, and you need to know the difference between POP3 and IMAP4. Then we have NTP, Network Time Protocol. Uh, it's used to synchronize time and date on TCP IP hosts and networks. And it uses a default port of UDP, port 123. And this gets uh, particularly important when you are administering networks. Uh, you want all of your hosts to be on the same wavelength, both date and time. There's nothing worse than, than getting an SN, SNMT message that says that something occurred at a specific time, and then you go to that host, and it's off on its time. Now you don't know when it really happened. Uh, I do recommend enabling NTP if you're administering networks. Then we have IGMP, which is Internet Group Multicast Protocol. It uses UDP on port 463. And what this is used for, as this is used to register for a multicast group. So your uh, dynamic uh, routing protocols like EIGR, EIGRP, uh, OSPF, so on and so forth, they use IGMP to register for the multicast on their given uh, networks and addresses so that they can find out about what other routers are out there. Another use of IGMP is in the gaming community. Community. So if you're doing like World of Warcraft, you're going to use IGMP to receive messages from that session, group messages from that session. Uh, it reduces the, the overhead because instead of having to send individual messages to multiple places, the same message to, to many individuals, it can send one message to the group. 
Now we have RTP, which is real-time transfer protocol, and that's used by voice over IP, and it delivers the data. It delivers the voice over the connection, and it can only do that after the connection has been established, and it does not use a predefined port. The two ends of the connection will uh, negotiate what port RTP will will occur over. And how does it do that in negotiation? Well, it uses SIP, uh, Session Initiation Protocol. That is what Voice over IP uses to establish and tear down communication channels between connections. And it uses uh, two ports, usually. It uses TCP and UDP, both. And it uses both on ports 560 and 561. So it has two ports that it uses, but it uses two uh, transport protocols on each of those two ports. Kind of confusing, but hey, it's networking. Now we've got SNMP2 and SNMP3. That's Simple Network Management Protocol versions 2 and 3. Uh, there are, nobody really uses SNMP1 anymore. Uh, they're both very similar. Uh, they both use UDP port 161, and that is how uh, and a network administrator monitors their network remotely. Uh, they set up what are called traps, and what a trap does is when an event happens or a trigger is triggered, it will send an SNMP message back to the uh, controller so that the network administrator will know that things have happened and specific things have happened. So those are the network protocols that you need to know. And here's the statement about us being an equal opportunity employer and what that means. Okay, hearing none, thank you for attending this session.